and welcome to the webinar Attracting Talent, uh, a fire safety sector for the future, hosted by Euralarm, who represents the fire safety and security industry, Eurolux, representing natural smoke ventilators and roof light manufacturers, the European Association for Passive Fire Protection, and the Modern Vanilla Alliance, representing the plastic industry in the construction sector. We are expecting, uh, so over 250 people have registered to this event from over 50 countries. Uh, and we hope that uh, this afternoon most of you will join us. And so you will also join us in the European Fire Safety Week that starts today. Um, due to the amount of participants to this event, you are all muted. But you can send your comments via the chat and your questions. Um, this is the first day of the European Fire Safety Week 2023, and we are happy to have with us this afternoon Mr. Christoph Biskup. Christoph has been serving as a fire a fighter for, for Poland, for the state fire service in Poland for 30 years, and is now the chair of the European Fire Safety Alliance. Christoph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good afternoon. So I have a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the European Fire Safety Week 2023. Let me remind that um, this is already the fifth time we meet at this leading European Fire Safety event. And like in previous years, the upcoming Fire Safety Week is going to be an umbrella for selected European Fire Safety initiatives. And all these initiatives have the common goal of improving fire safety across the EU and uh, better contribute to the implementation of the European Fire Safety Action Plan, which is the very first evidence and knowledge-based fire safety plan for Europe, and which was developed as a follow-up of the first edition of the European Fire Safety Week, which took place in 2019. So this year, together with our partners, we have prepared 11, I'm sure, interesting events covering the most important and topical fire safety problems which are in fact defined in the action plan. And so today we start with two webinars. The first one, we are just starting on fire safety professional skills and on attracting talent to fire safety, will be followed by the second webinar on fire safety and subsidiarity principle. In this webinar, we want to check what role the EU can play in fire safety without compromising subsidiarity principle. Tomorrow, here in Brussels, uh, two in-person workshops will be held. The first on electrical safety and deployment of heat pumps, photovoltaic panels and charging points in building. And the second will focus on evaluation and possible update of the European Fire Safety Action Plan after four years since it was developed. Wednesday, we'll start with the webinar on contribution to flame retardants, to fire safety and sustainability in strategic industry sectors. And the same day afternoon, a high level discussion on fire safety will be held in European Parliament. And uh, this discussion aim is to take stock of progress on fire safety and considering what next European Commission and European Parliament could do to improve fire safety of European citizens. On Thursday, DG Grow of the European Commission will organize a webinar on fire safety of the growing vulnerable community in the EU. It is going to be the part of fire information exchange platform activities. And on Friday, next European Smoke Alarm Day will be inaugurated. And Friday is not the last day, as this year, um, uh, Fire Safety Week will be concluded, in fact, next week with the seventh international education seminar organized in Linz, Austria. And this seminar will be combined with the European Fire Safety Award Ceremony for the best community fire safety projects. And at the end, I would like to mention that the results of this year's dialogue among the Commission officials, members of European Parliament, academics, fire safety researchers, 
industry, representatives of fire and rescue services and other organizations working on improvement of fire safety in Europe will contribute to the uh, EU Fire Safety Manifesto for 2024-2029, keeping EU citizens fire safe in all buildings, which is planned to be launched after the Fire Safety Week. Okay, that's the overview of the uh, All European Fire Safety Week. I wish all participants interesting week. Thank you very much for joining us. And you are highly welcome to take part, of course, in all events we prepared for you. And having this opportunity, I also encourage you to join our network and make Europe fire safe for all inhabitants. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to hearing the experiences of the panelists of this webinar on how to attract new talent to fire safety and how to improve the competencies in this area. Thank you very much. And Elisa, please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Krista, for your opening and for laying out for us the plan for the whole European Safety Week. May I ask you a personal question? Why did oh. you decide to become a firefighter? Mm. Speaking about talent and how to attract it. What was oh. your personal experience? <laughs> Okay, um, or, um, um, in, in my story might be quite interesting because before I became a firefighter, I was very close to becoming an arsonist. So um, <laughs> I, I got my, in fact, I got my first um, firefighting experience when uh, I was in a primary school. One day, together with my cousin, we decided to have a campfire very close to the forest. Because uh, I was a scout, we started quite professionally, in fact, uh, making a stone circle surrounding the place uh, for a campfire. But then my cousin brought very long tail of a dry plant and dropped it to the fire, while making at the same time a good bridge for flames to go over the stones. And because we were surrounded by dry grass, it was my first lesson how a grass fire can quickly spread. By the way, for your information, sometimes faster than people are able to run. So we took off our sweaters and tried to put out the fire, but with no success. Um, fortunately for us, uh, we made this fire in a small valley and the fire didn't spread to the forest. And after that experience, I decided to learn something about the glass fire. And because that time there was no internet, I went to ask volunteer firefighters and they proposed me to join the youth firefighters. I agreed, I joined, and when I got older, I became a volunteer firefighter. And I really loved this service because I felt that I was doing, you know, something uh, good that was important for other people. And, uh, you know, that's why after graduating from the high school, I decided to become a professional firefighter. And I passed exams and started my education in the May School of Fire Service in Warsaw. This, this is a, a quite a interesting in educational in the center because they train off fire, uh, fire officers and they educate at the same time fire safety engineers. And I'm really very happy and proud of my choice. Uh, we are also very happy that you did this choice. Thank you for sharing this uh, personal personal story of yours uh, that actually uh, is, um, well, family and friends are a quite common way to enter uh, the sector, um, to be honest, I'm not sure everybody enters for the same reasons, uh, but it was good to um, to see that you started uh, getting your interest so early in time. As you know, um, finding challenge remains a challenge for us. And this afternoon, we have the pleasure to have with us Mr. Andrew Veli, CEO of Ratmore Results. Andrew has helped CEOs and senior leaders to develop strategies, improve their performance and grow their businesses. And he will share with us his views and experience on how to make the fire safety industry attractive for newcomers. Andrew, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me along. I'm very grateful to be here today. Can I just check that you can all firstly, st firstly hear me? Some thumbs very up. Well. I'm going to play yeah. a little bit of video. Yeah. So again, if you can't see the video, the video has no sound to it when I start. Just wave, wave violently at me or something, and I will, I will make, I will make it work. So thank you very much. So I'm here to talk about uh, making this, the industry more attractive. Um, one of the things that um, we've found from our research is that um, there are three key things that need to be taken care of if you can attract people 
in what is called the Gen Z generation, those people have been born roughly since 2000. And I would describe them as, as follows. Firstly, you've got to really hit them on three things. Firstly, is the climate emergency, uh, economic and personal security. I think since Ukraine and since the, uh, the sort of downturn in Western economies we've seen over the last couple of years, that's become a lot more front and centre. And then also diversity and inclusion. And some very interesting research from the University of Edinburgh, um, and they described it as life support. And that was that... Uh, young people today are looking for jobs that support their way of life or the way of life they wish to have. They're not looking. They're not looking to live to work. They're looking to live to live and work to support their life. So that's our first big finding. Our research covers tech sector, defence, energy, and fire and safety and security. And um, so what I'm going to do this presentation is just reflect on some of the findings we have across those sectors. But before I start, I'm going to take you somewhere completely different. I'm going to take you to my my a couple of uh, my my old career, which is motorsport. I'm going to play a little bit of two uh, two minute video. If you can't hear it, please wave at me just to get you in the right frame of mind. This isn't just a thousand to one shot. This is a professional blood sport. And it can happen to you. What is so important about driving faster than anyone else? Racing is important to men who do it well. When you're racing. Life. Anything that happens before or after, it's just waiting. Great. You can still all hear me, presumably. Great. So thank you. So uh, that was my, uh, I was I was the head of design at McLaren Formula One. And that was my induction video. And I used to ask people, how do they make them feel? And they would say things like, well, it's like life in miniature. It's like, it's like the struggle, there's passion, there's what it means to be human. Um, there's heritage, there's history. And now I work in fire safety and security. I think I know an industry that's quite a lot like that which is about life and death and what's important to human beings. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper on this subject. So if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and Maslow, you probably know, is a very uh, famous psychologist. What Maslow said was we have um, five levels um, to allow us to function, as, to function as human beings. The first level is the psychological level, which is basically, do we get enough sleep? 
on sorry, the physiological level, which is do we get enough sleep, the basics of being human. Then we have a need for safety, and then we have a need for love and belonging. Once we have those in place, then, it, then it's possible for us to really excel as human beings. And if I look at our industry, our industry since the dawn of time has been providing at least those bottom three. But with the climate emergency, the rise of cyber and AI, its importance to families and our communities has never been better. And therefore, our industry allows us to move up the value chain to attract people at what really matters to them most, which is it's intellectually engaging, it's multidisciplinary and high tech, it's fairly well uh, paid, and, and certainly it's very secure given the nature, and, it's, and in fact, it's highly regulated. It involves teamwork, collaboration, and it's very social. It's got a social purpose and a very proud heritage, and it's vital to our climate and our communities. So in terms of an industry, it's hard to think of an industry that provides more of what we need to be human, and therefore really should be very, very attractive to anybody coming into it. So I'm just going to explore now um, some of the things we might do differently or what's 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 creating that issue. So we tend to uh, view the industry in a very functional way. We talk about it. We're all a lot of many of us are engineers. So we tend to talk about it as or practitioners as such as firefighters. We tend to, to focus it on things that we do, cameras, systems, monitors, fighting fires. But we don't talk enough about the why. And what our research shows that industries that talk about the why, uh, the defence industry in the UK talks very heavily about the why to attract talent, as does oil and gas and all, as does tech. They don't tend to talk about the what, they tend to talk about the why. If we reframe it to talk about the why, we might have a much more, we might be much more powerful in our recruitment. So let's quickly talk about the people we're trying to recruit. Um, I think there are two, two areas particularly we're trying to recruit. One is probably retaining staff. Uh, and um, in a longer presentation, we talk about the fact that it's very important to retain your staff as they enter their 50s and 60s because they have your corporate knowledge and they can also mentor and um, uh, and drive your, your you know drive your culture and your uh, learning within the organisation. But I'm going to focus today primarily on this younger group who we call Gen Z. Now, Gen Z in their makeup and their psychology are very similar to the baby boomers those who were born, um, who, who helped rebuild Europe after the Second World War. They're quite entrepreneurial. They'd like to take a bit of risk and they are trying to build a new world. They're very focused on the climate emergency. So actually, in terms of the, in terms of the optimism and entrepreneurial spirit of this generation, uh, it's probably higher than, uh, I'd say, Gen X or, 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 or a few generations before. And there's, some, again, some very, very nice research on this, which we can supply if asked. So the first thing is know your know your target market, know their psychology. The other thing is how we push this. So um, almost in one respect, um, our industry is by being so good at preventing fire and also uh, in enhancing our security uh, has become somewhat commoditized. But there have been a number of major incidents in the last few years which remind us of remind us of its historic importance and the fact that. Um, we need good people and capable people in our industries. We will need them forever. We've needed them for a millennia. We're going to continue to need them. And I think it's important to remind people of the importance of our industry in protecting our societies. Um, those of you, uh, uh, I was presenting in, in The Hague uh, with for Year Alarm a month or two ago, and everyone knows this picture, the Night Watch. And uh, this picture has huge kudos to be in the militia that was protecting Amsterdam in 1642 had huge kudos. But again, I think we've slightly commoditized it. Today, this is what's used to protect a, a Amsterdam. It's a simple camera. You might see some police or some security personnel around. But it's still a vitally important way of, um, for us to protect our societies. And we shouldn't therefore underrate it. Protecting our environment. Now, I show you a little triangle of the needs of, of, Gen, of Gen Z. We talked a lot about protecting our environment. And in the fire industry, protection industry, and the, and the technical side of the industry, clearly we are not doing a huge amount to prevent forest fires. However, uh, firefighters are, and we're trying to recruit into an industry. Therefore, there's a huge amount of, um, in terms of perception as reality, 
if we are positioning ourselves as helping prevent climate change, of uh, mitigating the effects of climate change, it's a hugely powerful message to young people to come and join our or industry. The other part is, I think we shouldn't forget, is the protecting our freedom, freedom, uh, the the, uh, the freedom of the nation state, and certainly with the rise, the rise, the rise of AI, the importance of the nation state to control and regulate and to protect citizens from the social and technological impacts of AI and harness them for the good to be very, very important. So whether we are bringing in facial recognition and doing that in a very ethical way, whether we are uh, looking at artificial intelligence or whether we're trying to pre predict and prevent future terrorist attacks. The role of our industry is absolutely vital. And as I said in my opening, my opening, uh, my opening words, probably more vital than it has been for some time. Next, we look at what do people want? And it doesn't seem to matter which survey you look at, they all come up with uh, a chart that looks a bit like this. Uh, compensation and benefits is normally number four or five. What people are interested in is, do, do I work with somewhere where it represents my culture and values? Have I got career opportunities to learn and grow? Do I like and respect the senior management? And there's some very interesting data which shows that 50% of employees in the US leave their jobs because of their leadership. So I, again, so I can't stress strongly enough the importance of, develop, of investing in leadership development. Many people want to lead well, but they just don't have the tools. And these tools are fairly easily taught. So again, if you want to retain staff, you want to attract staff, you want to grow staff, you need good leadership. So that investment is vital. The other thing I think is becoming more and more apparent simply since COVID is this work-life balance. I talked about this idea of life support as a effect rather than, than live to work. Um, and then I think the final one, which I love, is the business outlook. Remain optimistic. This is a tremendously important industry. It's vital to all of us and to our families and our communities. So that upbeat, uh, everyone wants to work for an enthusiast. So if I, if we were trying to pitch fire safety and security as a, as a career to go into, to um, someone who's at school or just about to graduate, this is how we might do it or how we might think about it. And again, I put this forward as a discussion point for consultation and for thought to be thought provoking. So we might think about it under these categories, which is the environment, communities, protecting our way of life. The fact it's multi-skilled and diverse, but it's quite, even it's quite a recession proof industry, uh, fire safety and security, because it's highly regulated and, and necessarily so, but also as a proud history of community service, which is something that we really do need to stress. So I'm going to conclude by asking uh, a couple of, uh, we went out and video with, I went out on the road and we spoke to a few people in the industry and uh, this is what they said. Again, if you can't hear the sound, please wave at me, but I presume you can. Okay, so I came from a very different industry um, in a lot of senses. It was of IT telephony, um, but actually it's still a very service led business. Um, so transferring those skills into fire and security has been really, really good for me. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And actually um, seeing how advanced the industry wants, to, like how ambitious it is, how it wants to get to providing the best security solutions for businesses. Essentially, everybody's going to need a security system for a very long time. So the ambition to make that the best through technology and changes within technology has, has been really, really refreshing to see. So, Shaz, what attracts you to this business, to this industry? At the end of the day, when I finish my job, I feel that I have saved someone's life. So if my work helps someone's, save someone's life, that's just an amazing feeling. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Thank you. I'll now take questions. OK, um, so thank you very much for for that insight on what the GNC is looking for and uh, what could potentially be the whys that we propose them. Um, if there's something you could change, Andrew, 
for the fire safety industry? What would that be? I think it's 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 perception is about big strapping mainly men going and fighting fires, and I think that we need to embrace the fact that through 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 technology, a lot of areas um, physical strength uh, is a lot less important than it's ever been. And therefore, by doing so, we will attract a most more di- much more diverse um, group of people. And I expect at the moment we're only looking. We you know obviously only probably if I said sixty percent of the people who could work for us, we're probably only in that pool. We need to widen the pool. The hundred percent of people who could work for us and work out what it takes to attract them. So the thing I would stop stressing is the 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 the, the physical nature of it and turn it much more into a purpose driven uh, industry. Okay, so let's say that um, we know now the why. How do we do this in practice? Uh, and uh, to think about that and reflect about that, we have the experience this afternoon of George Sitko. He's the CEO of an award winning talent solution for uh, global fire and security companies. And uh, he's with us this afternoon hopefully uh, giving us some insights on how to do this in practice. George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elisa. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. And uh, you've got the presentation up on the screen as well. Um, I'm going to set my timer. We're on strict timers for this uh, presentation. I'll get in trouble with Elisa if I don't stick to time. And Andrew's already kicked off fantastically well, so I need to keep up the momentum. Uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak to you all. Um, This is something uh, that uh, a a topic that I feel very passionately about and to give you the reasons why. As Elisa said, I run one of the largest talent solutions recruitment businesses that specializes in the fire and security sector. And we recruit internationally, predominantly across the UK, Europe uh, and the US. And uh, right from the start, um, we heard from Christoph and how he came into the industry. I'm also someone that fell into the industry. I was a recruitment consultant who had no experience of this industry and in 2004 was recruited by a security specialist business and fell in love. And I fell in love with the industry, with the purpose. We've heard Andrew talking about the why, even as a recruitment consultant, so someone that helped people find jobs in this industry, I felt like I was contributing to the community. I felt like I was contributing to people's safety, to people's welfare, and that the work that I was doing through the people that I was helping was making a difference. And I think if I can feel that, then absolutely everyone who actually does the jobs can certainly feel that too. And that's something that I feel that this industry is lacking. We have a real problem in that the industry has a bit of a chip on its shoulder that it doesn't feel like it's a valuable, worthwhile industry or career of choice that can't be marketed or presented to job seekers in a way that is attractive. And as you've heard from Andrew, I'm not going to talk too much about the why. You've heard about the why. What I'm going to focus on is a little bit about the process and what we can do to join the dots of knowing that we've got this fantastic purpose, why we might want to do that, and then how to actually make it work in action. So hopefully, I'm not actually going to play my video uh, because I couldn't get the sound to work. So I'm going to jump ahead to the video. But this is a phrase that I hear a lot. Whenever I talk to business owners, employers in the industry, or when I talk on panels or uh, careers advisory things, I hear this phrase, well, you know, the fire and security industry is not sexy. Uh, It's usually then followed by the phrase, no one grows up wanting to be in the fire and security industry. I don't remember anyone ever growing up wanting to be an accountant, yet those industries still know how to recruit people. And if you're like me, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a plumber. Um, Obviously, I'm not now. Most people nowadays that are growing up, Gen Z, if you ask them, they actually want to either be a TikTok influencer or a climatologist. So it's really important to remember the the choices that people make about their careers don't come when they're growing up so let's not get hung up about them they come actually in their formative years when they're starting to pick their subjects for education 
when they're starting to learn more about what they want to do as an adult, and when they're not even taking their first job, but when they realize what's out there. So the important thing is not to get hung up on the fact that no one wants to be in this industry. The important thing is how do we get in front of them at the right time when they're making these decisions? And we've got the why, it is about awareness. So the reason that we have a talent issue at this moment in time isn't actually for these reasons, as far as I'm concerned, it's more because of these reasons. One of the uh, best things about this industry is it has continued to grow throughout recessions, throughout economic climates, throughout global crises. Security and fire never goes off the agenda. Safety never goes off the agenda. So this industry has continued to grow regardless of, of the uh, economic outlook for the last 20 years that I've been in it and beyond. But also it's become more competitive. The amount of people that have been coming into the industry has got less. We have an aging workforce. So uh, the skills that we demand of our people now are different. You know, the skills required, as you've heard, of a firefighter are different now to what they were 25 years ago. It's the same with technicians as well. And employers overall have been um, uh, reticent to change and adapt and to modernize, which has meant there have been less people coming through the pipeline. So the reason for the skill shortage isn't because the industry isn't sexy. It's actually because we as an industry, employers in the industry, haven't been working hard enough to market the reasons that people should join. And there's some, for me, that's an opportunity. The uh, industry that we work in is incredibly, uh, um, uh, what's the word, incredibly um, worthwhile. It's positive, it's secure. And we have an opportunity to use these issues actually as a, a chance to recruit a more talented, younger, interested, engaged, and diverse work workforce than we have at the moment. And there's some really interesting data to back this up. So Gallup ran a state of the workforce survey in 2023, which surveyed nearly 100,000 people globally about how they felt about their work. And the most interesting data that came out of it, and that's a list of the questions that you can see there, it's based on their Gallup 12 survey. It's an industry-wide recognized standard to assess how happy are people in their work? How happy are people in their jobs? And what you notice, and I've picked the European region here because I believe the majority of the delegates in this um, uh, webinar um, are based in Europe, is that actually underwhelmingly people are disappointed. They're not happy in their work. Um, uh, something like, uh, if you look there, the top country in terms of employee engagement is Romania. My country, the United Kingdom, apparently only 10% of people are truly engaged in their work. Now, what that means is that when we look at the things as Andrew has elaborated on, why do people want to come to work? This industry actually has a huge amount to offer. And when we think about those things, they all fit not just into the absolute higher level purpose of why, but then they also fit into some of the other fundamentals that people are looking for, which is things like stability. Can I develop myself? Uh, are, are, um, uh, is my manager going to look after me? Can I earn enough to live? Can I progress? Is the technology moving forward? And is there enough variety in my work? And we can offer all of this. And not only can we offer it, at Zitco, we've run a European-wide satisfaction survey based on similar metrics. And when we look at our own industry and the performance, as you can see, 91% of people are optimistic about the future of the industry. 85% report they're in a positive place. So compare that to 10% of people in other industries, and we have an absolutely huge opportunity to recruit the right people to survive and thrive in our industry. But how are we going to do it? So the first thing to understand is that if we just try and recruit people in our space, so in other words, people that are already working in the industry, we're going to fail because there's not enough. It's as simple as that. So we need to understand that there is a huge market, whether it's Gen Z, whether it's uh, baby boomers, whether it's those people outside in other industries that are dissatisfied, there is a huge amount of transferable skills and aptitude that we can tap into. We've just got to know how to do it. And to give you a bit of context, I've got seven minutes left on my timer. This is something that we run um, daily uh, training courses on. So I'm not going to give you full chapter and verse. But what I am going to give you is the kind of three components that absolutely will work if you put them into place 
and identify the kind of people that you're looking for. So we've heard everyone falls into this industry. Even Andrew, Andrew's fallen into this industry. He probably didn't even know about it before he joined, but now he loves it. Look how passionately he spoke about it. So um, everyone either joins the industry because of family and friends, because they see what it's like to work in and they see that why, they see that higher purpose. They see how happy their parents or their friends or their family are in the industry and think, that's where I want to work. Or like me, they come across it by complete chance, replying to an advert, and then once they're in it, they stay. If you look at the amount of people that say, oh, I fell into it, but they're still here, and why they're still here, it's huge because it's a valuable, it's a fantastic industry to work in. So what we want to do, I get asked in the US a lot because they have everywhere in Europe, everywhere in the US, everyone is struggling to recruit the right people. Simple as that. It's a global problem. So I get asked in the US, what's the secret source? That's the phrase they say. And the secret source is simply understanding that there are tons and tons of people that want to work in this industry. We've just got to put it in front of them. If we, rather than be reactive and say, oh, we'll just wait for people to fall into it. If we can get out there and tell them about the why, if we can talk to them about these um, uh, uh, value uh, proposition that Andrew explained, then they are going to be interested and they're going to want to work in it. So the first stage, as I said, I've split the, the things up into three. The first stage as an employer trying to recruit talent is before you go out to market is to prepare. And when we say prepare, it's not just in preparing your recruitment process, it's in preparing your team. If, we're, if we've identified that we have to recruit people from outside of the industry, it's really important to engage your existing workforce. It's important to engage the hiring managers that are going to be doing the recruitment. They've got to understand what they're looking for. What's the common denominator? They've got to be able to eloquently explain your company's mission, vision, and values, the things that make you different. And every company in this industry is different, whether you're recruiting fire safety, fire technicians, security tech, it doesn't matter. Every company is unique and has its own value proposition, as well as the higher purpose that we've alluded to. So it's really important to engage your team, make them aware of what you're looking to do. And in some cases, given that we are going to be taking people uh, from outside of the industry that have transferable skills, training is a big part of it. And I often get asked, well, we don't have an academy. We don't have a school. We don't have an HR. It doesn't actually have to be that complicated. The general, generally accepted sweet spot for training of individuals in any regard is about one seventh theoretical classroom type training and six sevenths practical. If you all think about your own lives and your own jobs, where did you learn the most after your education and things like that? And it was out in the field. It was learning through experience. It was learning in the real world. So actually identifying that and maybe identifying the people within the business that can do it and understanding that you don't have to suddenly lump a load of people into the classroom and then identifying what they're going to be training or supporting those newbies on is very, very important. So preparation is really key. And this was a slide that I took from one of our employers that really tapped into that. And what they did is they presented to their managers and said, look, here's what we're going to be recruiting you. And as you can see on the left, absolutely incredible worthwhile habits that any employer would want from their new staff. But on the right, what they weren't promising was perfection, legacy experience, or as you see at the bottom, the best bit, miracles. It's not easy, you've got to work at it, but if you get it right, it's uh, transformational. So that's the prep. The second bit is the recruitment. We're going to systemize the falling in. We're not going to wait for people to do it. We're going to create the process. We're going to shove these people into the industry. We're going to be loud. We're going to be proud. And we're going to talk about all of that value prop stuff that Andrew mentioned. And not only are we going to talk about it, we are going to tap into the media that works. Part of the problem, again, from employers at this moment in time, is they are not advertising in the right places for the right people. And I won't dwell on that slide, but to give you an idea, in order to get the bums on seats in the roles that we need to create the, uh, uh, to fill the gap that the shortfall has created, we basically need to get this industry in front of half a million new people. Half a million new people, that's massive, that's big marketing in order to then get the conversions down to the people that we want to recruit. And that is just the list of the things that you need to think about. And that's why we run days on it. It is not easy. But if I can give you two examples that I think really sum this up, you look at all of the other ways that most modern companies in other sectors and in other industries are getting in front of their people. One of them is obviously social media. How many employers around this room have an active campaign on TikTok? I guarantee 90% won't. 
Well, that is where Gen Z are spending a frightening amount of their time at the moment. And I have young children. It's a frightening amount of their time. The second thing, look at Formula One. Look at the uptick in engagement that they've had, not since increasing their advertising budget, but since their documentary series on Netflix. That has increased their awareness as well. And I was in the uh, Euroline presentation. One of the chaps said, why don't we create a TV show? And that's not easy, but it's exactly the right way of thinking. The final thing is how are brands advertising their, me their mission at the moment? And it's not through selling their product. It's talking about how many trees they're planting. So this message is really important. We've got to get it in front of the right people and not tell them about our jobs, which is invariably what most companies do. But as Andrew says, we've got to tap into what's important to them right now. And the job information comes secondary. So it's not easy. So the final bit then is how do we then keep them? It's all very well working really, really hard to get these people in, but then how do we keep them? And again, I'm going to use an example. Uh, we launched our product, uh, our talent product, which was all about systemizing this process, putting it into practice to help employers recruit their people. And at the time, uh, uh, there were less than 1% female technicians in active roles. And I'm a big believer in equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. So it's not about creating 50% you know, female technicians, 50% male. It's about making sure that we attract as diverse a pool of talent as we possibly can and then work to support them, whatever they're doing. So if a female joins a business where there's only one other female, what are the chances of her being retained by that business? They're a lot lower than the other men that are joining. So even something that simple, creating mentorship opportunities, support networks, frameworks, uh, guidance, all of these things, whatever background, whatever um, uh, um, uh, uh, individual, whatever age, whatever type of person we're recruiting, we've got to think about how, that's my alarm going off for the uh, timer, we've got to think about how we retain them and what we can do to support them in their work. So um, training is the biggest thing. And again, this is something that this industry is absolutely phenomenal on but we just don't make enough of. It's one of the key drivers for retention with people once they've joined a job, it's in their top three, can I develop and improve in my job? And we've got the stats that you know back this up. When we went out to market, that same survey that I told you about that highlighted how happy everyone was, you could see the differential between the satisfaction primarily of the people that had had training uh, and the ones that hadn't, and the key driver for why people wanted to move jobs training came up. So there are many ways to support people once we've got them in, but training is one of the easiest ways to do it. So really simple, he says, prepare, recruit well, and don't just take it as an easy thing. It's hard. You've got to work at it and market the right things. And then once we've got these people, work really hard to keep them. And that's it. If you want to download the uh, a guide in full, uh, feel free to get your phone, scan the QR code. It will take you straight to the page. It's free to download. And if you have any further questions, please let me know. How was that, Elisa? Very, very good. Um, a little bit faster. Let me let me give you a little bit the floor for a little bit longer and ask you one additional question. Sure. Because I think your conversation, so your speech has inspired people. Uh, but what of the techniques do you think we could employ in the industry? to increase our pool of talent? What are the techniques? Yeah. So- um, What would you recommend? Absolutely, so, so the first thing is uh, employers, uh, I, I think it's employers' responsibility. I think the trade associations and the professional bodies do a fantastic job in creating uh, conversations like this to facilitate change. Um, but ultimately, it is the responsibility of the employers. You know, they're the ones that have to drive that. So the first thing that I would say is uh, treating the recruitment process, as I said, as a much more structured, detailed machine. It's not a reactive process. It's a machine that takes a lot of care, a lot of effort, and it changes all the time. As I said, if you ask most talent acquisition recruiters, business owners where to advertise, they'll say Facebook because that's where they sit. But actually, it's not, as I've, as I've said before. So treating it as a machine, treating it as a process, understanding the multiple components to it, those are the things, first of all, to understand. The second thing is the obvious one. If you carry on doing what you've done before, you're not going to make any change. You've got to understand that um, uh, uh, things like uh, gender neutral advertising, associations with professional organizations, 
multiple platform organizing, different messaging, as I said, not just talking about the job, talking about the uh, the purpose, the why, as Andrew has said. All of these things help create that massive funnel to get uh, this industry in front of as many eyeballs as possible. And the fantastic thing is, whether it's at apprentice level um, or at uh, adult retrainer, when you start talking to people about this industry, their eyes light up. They think, you know, you hear again, the phrase we hear a lot is, I didn't even know this industry existed. So there's a huge opportunity there. And then I guess the final thing, as I said, is no, not getting hum, hung up on, oh, no one wants to join. It's about thinking, well, how can we make those 16 to 24 year olds? How can we tell them about the industry? What can we do? Which local organizations or schools or universities can I go in and present and tell them about what we do? And if everyone does that, this industry won't have a talent shortage in five years. OK, so that's a lot of food for thought there. Uh, there's one question that we will have later, but that has been in the in the chat that I want to give you already. Uh, Thank you. Because the question is how to involve Gen C in the recruitment. And I will go for both of you, for, for you and for Andrew. Uh, but let me give the floor to Miguel, first of all, because nowadays digital, digitalization is a key mega trend also in the fire safety industry. And uh, to share that experience on how to differentiate your services as an industry through innovation, we have the pleasure of having with us this afternoon, Miguel Cole, Global Portfolio Director of Fire Safety Services at Siemens. Um, and I just want to give you the floor, Miguel, so that you share with us. The Thank negative. you. Thank you, Elisa. I'm happy to be part of the European Fire Safety Week 2023. And let me give you in the next 15 minutes an overview of where the where the industry is going, the, the fire safety uh, industry. When when I'm going to refer to fire safety in my presentation, I'm, I'm going to refer to the fire safety in buildings mainly. So let's um, take this overview together with me. Um, I'm going to be starting with global trends on the on the buildings and around the buildings. So there's a lot going on on the political and regulatory environment with sustainability, including a lot of new targets and requests from buildings. Uh, uh, of course, the, the war and the global energy is not making the situation easy. Um, Digital is coming into buildings for a few years now, and with that, the codes are evolving. In fire, we've, we've had a strong regulatory framework for many, many years, but now more topics are coming into the building with cybersecurity, with data protection, etc. Then we have on the on the economic side, uh, inflation raising, and that uh, put a put a pressure on the budgets and the budget put a pressure on how our technology is involved. Remember the, the technologies in buildings, they come into the building and they stay there for 10, 15, sometimes even 20 or more years. So it is very important to have a very well planned budget to plan on the maintenance and on the uh, actualization of the technologies. Um, on the uh, demographics and, and social, I mean, we've heard Andrew and George with very interesting overview of what's going on on the on the uh, also manpower, but um, we suffer in the industry a, a strong um, lack of resources. I mean, our technologies are aging and the people that know our technologies uh, in deeply are starting to retire, so we struggle to get enough people to to work on the buildings on on the amount of the of technologies that uh, coexist now in buildings the user experience is is an uh, an interesting topic buildings are becoming very dynamic and incorporating more and more technologies and the dynamic of the building is increasing from the tenant and from the user point of view and then of course we we went through covid and that left us with a with a complete change in the way that we use our buildings. So the flexibility needed and the you know the expectations of the people working in buildings in 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 terms of uh, life work balance that is also a a, a big uh, aspect to take into account. The technology I'm going to refer to more uh, more in detail as we get into the challenges in the building. 
Um, sustainability is is a, is a big topic today. I mean, if if we think about buildings consuming forty percent of the global energy, that is huge. So of course there is a high pressure on buildings to optimize the way uh, they use energy. Then safety and security is a topic that comes more and more as we open more doors in the buildings through digital connections. Um, so um, we see we see a lot of increased demand for security topics. Um, the customer expectation is increasing. So more than 70% of building owners, they believe that it is key to have a uh, an attractive and a proper design in order to be successful in recruiting and keeping companies in in using and and uh, I would say uh, renting and being being part of the buildings. So there is a there is a huge focus on make those buildings dynamic. Uh, make them flexible and make them um, um, appropriate for the use that they that they constantly uh, require. Uh, we talk about the the maturing workforce, um, the 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 pressure on on cost, the the compliance, the aging infrastructure with new technologies coming in that need to interoperate with existing uh, infrastructure, and last but not least, false alarms. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail about false alarms. So now getting to fire safety in specific, the economic uncertainty poses a big pressure on the budget, and in many cases, the the fire detection technology, which is uh, very robust and very reliable, get short cut in 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 the budget which is allocated. And that makes that fire is sometimes looking at investment on the on the bare minimum to keep it running. And with that, it, it is faced with problems that when they arrive, they cost a lot of money to, to resolve. If we look at the fire risk, the fire risk in buildings is, is evolving uh, hugely with new materials coming in, with uh, electrical vehicles, we, we charge in stations. So the way and the amount of different fire risks that we that we look at today is completely different to the one we had 20 years ago when the when most of the of the codes and regulation for buildings were written. The the labor shortage is is a topic uh, which now comes. Uh, at at the core of the of the industry because this industry has been always perceived as a as a very traditional very old fashioned industry and and it's totally the opposite nowadays and we're going to see where the where the digital features are taking this industry um the interoperability is a challenge by uh, the need of the amount of new technology coming into the building and and the and the aging technology which is still part of the building. So that's also um, a, a big challenge. And moving forward into the false alarms, I want to briefly show a summary of the Euro alarm study on false alarms on electronic fire detection systems. Uh, is the second edition of this study. It gathers the information from many European countries, and it's amazing to see that 85 to 90 percent of the alarms that are produced by electronic systems are false alarms. False alarms can be uh, technical failures. It can be deceptive phenomena, so physical or chemical phenomena that impacts the, the sensoric in, in, in the detection systems or can be malicious, good intent or uh, unintended, but uh, uh, it, it can be provoked by, by, by humans. So we have today a number of technologies from the digital side and from the uh, new technologies coming into, into the industry that could help us I wouldn't say avoid the false alarms, but 
drastically reduced them from that 85, 95% that we have today. We're getting now into the, the digital part. So collecting data in, in the maintenance of a building. Why, why do we want to collect data? Well, I like this picture from McKinsey. It's showing that if you collect data, you're going to be able to go in at least three different directions. One is condition based. So it's the minimal data to understand what's going on and better plan the, the, the interventions, better plan the activities. You can be more advanced and, and do uh, advanced troubleshooting based on data. So complex topics, if I keep data on a database, I can compare similar situations and understand what can be the solution or then moving into the sophisticated predictive maintenance. That means I only go and react on a system when the data shows that the system needs that. It's a, it's a nice approach, but in all cases, this is where we're going. It, it helps us uh, improve the business continuity or the uptime, the predictability, which is strongly associated to cost efficiency, because if we're able to predict we're not going to be spending a lot of money to solve the topics. Um, for sure, we're going to go on site maybe once with the right spare parts and, and the right knowledge of, of what's going on. So digitalization is going to help us in, in a variety of uh, different aspects around the fire systems. We're going to be quicker to react. We're going to be able to uh, better utilize the resources because if we have information uh, of, of what's going on, the people that we have on site can be less or can be less skilled and, and have the proper support from our pop site. Um, we're going to have um, a, a, a drastic reduction on the downtime by better understanding the topics before uh, they occur. We're going to be able to improve the way we spend the money and Last, we're going to be able to act on the system really when it's needed. So in the classical approach to fire services, where we were using corrective maintenance to go and repair when something's broken or preventive when we go once or twice a year on site, we're now moving into three, four, and five. That is uh, enhanced maintenance through data or condition-based maintenance by using, using data to, to decide whether uh, one or the other solution is better. And in the future, as I mentioned before, we're going to be able to predict and only uh, perform activities when, when it's needed. Um, a definition for, from Verdantix, so we, we all talk about digital services. What, what does it really mean? And I like this definition because it's very, it's very concrete. If we are leveraging technology, connectivity, or system or sensor data to remotely understand what's going on and support interventions or support local operation, then we are applying digital services. I like this definition. It, it can be found in different uh, Packages like connected, integrated services, enabled services, digitize, or something as a service, or something performance contracts. But this is, I think, a, a good approach. So, what what does it mean in the topology? Well, there are systems. It can be networks. It can be a, a single system that are connected through a gateway and relying on data security and relying on analytics and visualization, we provide overview, we provide dashboards, we provide uh, remote visualization, we provide um, um, proposed measures for um, service or resolutions or troubleshooting. This is in, in file safety, the general topology that the industry is adopting. What does it mean in terms of the different type of features or services that are available? Well, there is usually a, a powerful uh, dashboard. It's a, it's a portal, it's a means of communication with the, with the building user. 
with the tenant, with the facility manager, and this provides access to a mail right of different information from uh, contractual information to technical information to reports to status to uh, tickets and the and the workflow on tickets. So for for the user, this means uh, being at the top of what's going on, understanding perfectly what what is the status and the health of the system. It can be viewing a different locations. It can be on a single location. It can be used for preparing audits and reports. So it's um, in the future the the main means of communication with the facility managers and owners of buildings. Remote supervision. This this is uh, at the core of gaining efficiency bec because this means that all connected sites can be overlooked by experts on different disciplines. And these experts can can support troubleshooting, can in the future interact with the systems and, and maybe modify, improve, and even solve topics from, from remote. Um, and best of all, they can they can support the local operations. So a complex troubleshooting can be reduced in the time and, and the time to fix, the time to repair can, can be minimized. Even technicians that need to go on site by talking with experts on a digital center, they can prepare the intervention and uh, understand what is to be done, have the spare parts, and so on and so forth. When we talk about the, the mobile apps that can be available for users of the building, this is a, a huge advantage because that means I'm, I'm permanently informed of what's going on in the building, what is the severity of the events coming in, is that uh, something that needs to be resolved on a on a Sunday evening, or can can this wait uh, wait until Monday because it's just a, uh, the charge on a battery that is going low? So transparency, control, efficiency, and and minimize the the risk in the, in the operation. Digital reports, a key topic when we think about complex uh, campus. Uh, manufacturing locations, complex operation, it's difficult to understand what is going on in a big system. With a with a multiple different programmings on, on different type of peripherals and, you know, the reports can help me understand whether I'm too sensitive or too harsh in the programming on certain uh, zones of the building and be together with the building dynamics evolving the programming and the uh, resilience of the of the system so buildings are dynamics that doesn't mean that our fire system cannot be dynamic we can we can follow the programming and the fine tuning of the system to follow the building dynamics typical example is uh, in a hospital what was previously a, la a laundry now becomes a meeting room and the fire risk in one and the other is completely different. So if I have my, my detectors program for a harsh environment, which is a laundry, and that changes to a meeting room, I'm running the big risk that uh, a smoldering fire will not be detected, things like that, or could be the opposite components or parts of the system constantly going into pre-alarm or even false alarm because they have the wrong program. So I make the installation more robust, more resilient by having the reports available. And I'm looking at the time, so I need to hurry up. The industry, and this is key for capturing uh, talent today, the, the industry doesn't anymore need the technicians that only perform a, a manual activity on the system. We are moving, sorry, we are moving into um, requesting people that are fire digital consultants that will be advising the customer on, on the needs of the system. Also from, and specific for Europe, we, we start to see uh, 
European norms, and this has the strength of a, of a law, that regulate the way in which we provide uh, services in fire and insecurity. So it's interesting to see that now we have a framework to work professionally in providing digital services to the to the market. And with that, I want to leave you with some uh, takeaways. So the fire industry has changed in the last five to 10 years tremendously. We are in a digital journey. We are focused on innovation. We are focused on bringing the latest and the best technologies to the fire industry. We are part of the smart buildings. I mean, there is no smart building without smart uh, fire safety. We are also expected to be digital. So our customers in healthcare, in the industry, they run electronic processes for procurement, for uh, maintaining and operating the machines for everything they do. And they expect this industry to be part of the dashboard, to be parts of the planning and the, and the digital features of the, of the buildings. Um, this industry embraces remote work today. That wasn't the case of a few years ago. This industry is a committed to sustainability. I mean, I see more and more uh, circular economy in the equipments that we manufacture. I see more and more uh, caring about how we use the, the water and the energy and how we operate our supply chain with sustainable trucks and you know sustainable plastics being used in, in the design. Uh, it's an industry that is uh, deeply into diversity and inclusion. And last but not least, this is an industry with a strong purpose, which is protecting life. So this industry is very sexy, to stress what uh, George already said, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Miguel, uh, for uh, driving us through this digital journey that the industry is undergoing at the moment. Uh, and for sharing also with us the results of the FAST alarm study that your alarm has updated recently and that we will make sure that we share with the people that are interested. Um, from my side, in this road from fire technician to digital fire consultant, I have the impression that might fit better with the generation set. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think we can offer today to these more technical profiles working in the industry? Well, for sure, it's it's um, now embedded into into innovation and and digital tools. So it be, it becomes very attractive because people from IT or people that that is deep into technology would very fast understand and be able to uh, be highly productive in the fire industry. So I think the contrary to what it used to be years ago, where you need to study complex systems in 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 fire and a lots of codes and standards today it's um, uh, for people coming from uh, any technology any advanced technology it's um I, I think it's easy to to step into these type of roles so um you have all been in your best behavior and uh, we are spot on on time uh, but i still want to use the possibility of, of having your inputs and your insights in one question that has appeared in the chat while you were speaking. Um, mm -hmm. Just in case not all of you have seen it, let's see what is your view on. Uh, so the question is how we could share our values on Gen Z. I think George has answered to that at least partially. How do we reach them? Uh, and then there was a spin off of that question and how can we involve Gen Z in recruitment? Uh, do you have any ideas on this that you would like to share? I, I've got a perspective, if I may share it. Please. I'm just going to share a slide to illustrate the point, I think, which is a, share, a slide that we uh, talked through with the Euralarm governing board in The Hague recently. Can everyone see the slide? Let's say fire safety and security. Yeah. Lisa, can you give me a thumbs up? Brilliant. Yeah. Yes. So I think. I think um, what this slide is saying is that don't start, don't start at the end. 
if we think about the recruitment cycle we go through for people um if you're in the tech industry you tr you know we you go into schools and then have you gone to schools and attracted them you then to help them try to influence their, their exam choices to go into technical subjects and then you'd pick them up at 16 and encourage them to go and study in the area so this you really got to start you, you really have a strategy which goes through the whole life cycle of someone's career from the age of probably about eight or nine that's what all the other industries do what defense do tech do oil and gas they're all in their lobbying from a school age the other thing they do is that they very much focus on keeping uh staff as well and an awful lot of technical organizations have a fellows grade which are people who who may have semi-retired but still want to come into the office who want to add their time generally they're they're on some sort of stipend they're just people who others can hang out with to learn from but also it is a you know in many respects a lot of our businesses are very physical so moving people and retraining them to work in the offices uh, where they can add huge that huge value and allows them to be retained in a different role is also vitally important. So part of the messaging that we've been giving out is that you need to have, as, as George said actually earlier, is you know you've got to work at it, you've got to keep going at it, and you've got to iterate, and it's a, and it's a full process. If you approach it like a full process, not when you find the individuals, but then you'll you'll go through this whole career life cycle journey. So I hope that answers part of the question. It does. Um, George, I think maybe you would like to get the floor also on this one. That was a really bad time for my teams to crash, so I missed all of Andrew's answer and I had to join <laughs> it. Uh, did you, uh, Andrew, put an interesting counter question in? Can we involve Gen Z in the recruitment? Is that something you touched upon, Andrew? No, what I said was, yeah. I think it's George, it was the slide that when you and I spoke to the Euroalarm Governing Council in the Hague, yes, yeah. I think you hopefully you can see the slide. I was saying yeah. that. You have to go, you, have, you know, it's like, how do we get us ourselves out of this mess? Well, I wouldn't start from here. What I was saying was that you have to get people from uh, what you said, as I was reflecting what you said, get them at school, you know, early in their school career, keep touching base all the way through. And then the main thing is to ensure that you don't you don't lose staff. If your staff say, I want to become office based because of my age or, you know, I'm getting sore knees or whatever, you know, Keep, bring them into the offices, help them to add value in a different role. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think uh, so that I don't repeat um, what's been already said, I think uh, I had a quick look at the delegate list and you know, I noticed that there's some really sizable companies. There's a lot of marketing professionals, you know, in in the, uh, 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 that have joined us working on behalf of these big safety and fire safety companies. The biggest common denominator for Gen Z, whatever the whatever we talk about, whatever the message is video, you know, video has been Know, massive or sorry increasing in prevalence for the last 15 years so whether it's tiktok tv netflix youtube your website your career's website your um you know home page whatever it might be video is the common denominator and uh, again you know what you put on that video is really important if you put people like me on that video talking about how great the industry is your engagement is not going to be as high as putting on your youngest apprentice or your case study for the kind of person that you're trying to recruit. So the format of the video, what's on there is super, super important and it's the most powerful tool that we can use. So, um, yeah, I hope I hope that adds to what uh, what Andrew said, Elisa. I'm really sorry. That was such a bad time for the for the app to be. Thank you. Yes, yes, it does. Um, Miguel, would you like to say something from your side? I can I can only say that this industry is uh, so focused, so much focus in innovation in the last few years that it, it makes a, a very good career for any technical profile out there. I mean, before it was a, a slow moving industry. Fire industry was only code. Uh, regulated uh, type of approach in products and in services. Now it's the opposite. Everything we're, cre we're creating in the last few years is for selling above regulations. So we, we are certainly selling technology and innovation to building users that is uh, even not requested by, by codes today. So it's very innovative industry. Yeah, um, the colleague in the chat is saying that um, they have been campaigning for behavioral change. And one of the things that they have discovered is that TikTok seems not to be enough. 
that the videos somehow have to be genuine, which I think George goes in line with what you somehow were saying. Yeah, I'd love to respond to that. It's, ex it's exactly right. You know, the um, you know pe people will talk about stories. You know, using stories to uh, to convey a message, um, but those stories have to be genuine. As I said, if it's if it's me talking to a camera talking about my experience, it's not the same. For example, as a day in the life, you know, dash cam, head cam, whatever it might be. Um, talking to people about what they do, you know, how did I change the world today? How did I save a life? How did how did I get involved in some incredible tech like Miguel's talking about that you just don't know about? So it, again, it doesn't have to be Netflix quality. It can just be real people talking about their real world experience, what they're doing, um, and as long as that conveys uh, um, uh, honesty, uh, passion, uh, the the why that I keep coming back to that Andrew talks about, then you're in business. OK, so, so basically it's a little bit catch 42. Uh, first, we have to find the Gen C, then to to attract additional Gen C. That's what you're saying. It. That's it. You, and but and before that, you've got to make sure that your people you're working with, they're part of it as well. It's absolutely a holistic solution. Because don't forget, you know, if you're working for a 50,000 employee business, then that's a lot of children and a lot of friends and family that are also potentially people that can come and work in this industry. So, yeah, it's, you know, prepare internally, then go out and find them and then convey the right message and then work really hard to keep them. Yeah, the tech, the tech, the tech community spent an awful lot of time in schools. We, in my personal experience, we always used to go out to schools like two or three times a year. We ran big, uh, what in the UK is called STEM, which is the sciences, technology, and engineering, and mathematics as a big program. And we used to run programs. We used to get 100 to 150 school children at a time into the building to talk to them about, you know, science, technology, and what we did. Um, and also, there's a lot of good social influences out there. Both, both my children actually enough are in uh, TV and media and they both run quite big uh, accounts where they do a lot of social influencing so if you've got somebody in your community you can do that then have them reach out post things which are genuine and that will appeal to their to their sort of their their their, 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 their cohort effectively okay so thank you very much for sharing all these insights with us um, we have to move on to the second part of the panel because once we have uh, recruited people or attracted their interest, we also have to educate them and ensure that they have the highest professional qualification. But just for you to know that the last speaker is going to speak about a Dutch TV series about how to get women into construction that you might like to hear. So stay with us. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for joining us. This, uh, this afternoon. So fire Pleasure. safety requires not only a strong education and qualification, but also uh, a lot of years of professional experience. Um, the demand for competent fire safety engineers is growing rapidly, but um, we are facing and thinking how we could uh, ensure having qualified professionals and prevent shortage of well-educated people uh, in Europe. To share the experiences and the results of the assessment uh, that they have done, Mother Binding Alliance uh, has, um, has undertaken a, a fire safety engineering competency study and has some industry recommendations that this afternoon Mr. Franklin Aguara is kindly going to share with us. Franklin is a specialist both in fire safety engineering and in, in, in safety engineering altogether. And um, Franklin, the floor is all yours. Yeah, um, thank you, Elisa, for the kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me today. And thank you again for joining today's webinar. So I'll tell you a little bit about Modern Building Alliance. Uh, this is an uh, European Alliance of Trade Association and companies representing the plastics industry in the construction sector. Uh, fire safety is a very important topic for us. Uh, it is a key driver of our product design and manufacturing. Therefore, we are committed in supporting the EU in ensuring safe and sustainable construction for people across the EU. Uh, in this context, uh, we support the IMFSE program, which is the International Masters 
in fire safety engineering to contribute to the uh, development of fire safety practices. Um, in our industry recently, we made an assessment of fire safety engineering and some worked out uh, recommendations. So uh, this is what I will be presenting to you today. Um, uh, the the their need for fire safety knowledge and competency it just centers around the current challenges uh, in the building and construction industry. Um, building technology uh, and practices have continued to evolve. Uh, new technologies are being added to the building envelope. Uh, structures are getting more taller, more complex. Um, even family houses now have open plans that you can integrate your kitchen uh, with the living room. Uh, the question now will be, how do we ensure that fire hazards are mitigated in complex situations? Um, there is always a place for prescriptive approach and understanding these requirements are essential. However, in uh, designing and building complex buildings, it has been acknowledged that prescriptive regulations are not helpful to an extent. This is where the fire safety engineering comes in. Um, the Hackett report, uh, which is a report commissioned by the British government to make recommendations on the future regulatory system. It indicates that uh, we must start thinking about building as a system so that we can consider the different layers of uh, protection that may be required to make the building safe in a system in such a way that uh, the amount of doors you put, the size of the evacuation way determines how much uh, people uh, can evacuate from the building. But before I dive into the whole presentation, I would like us to have another look at another report, which is called the uh, Benefit Report. Um, for the people who are aware, uh, the Benefit Report was commissioned in 2001 by the EU Commission, and it was aimed to identify the potential benefits of applying fire safety engineering approach in the European Union. Um, one of the tasks was uh, to conduct a survey uh, to the member states to assess the regulations and the fire safety engineering used at, at the national level. Um, this survey led to several uh, recommendations. So firstly, um, it recommended that uh, it would be good to create a network of fire regulators to add this transitioning from prescriptive approach to the performance-based approach. Um, the um, second recommendation is for a harmonized framework for a performance-based approach in the EU. Um, the third request was to set up an advisory committee on fire safety engineering research. Uh, the JRC is really doing a, a tremendous work on this. And um, fourthly, uh, the recommendation was to develop mandate for standardization. And I know the CEN, uh, the CEN TC working, 127 working group eight, they are really having a lot of work ongoing on this. And um, the last recommendation on my list urges that all necessary actions should be taken to first uh, define the education, uh, uh, the to define the professional education needs, and also to define the conditions for professional recognition of fire safety engineering field. Um, years after this report, one may ask what is really the situation of these recommendations now. Um, how far have we gone at the national level to adopt fire safety engineering? All recommendations of the uh, benefit project uh, are to be executed in totality to develop fire safety engineering in EU. I believe uh, that it will be 
necessary for us to revisit the outcomes and lessons that we are learned uh, from the Benefit project. Um, now we go a little bit further to understand what currently exists in fire safety engineering trainings and why it is very important now. Um, to be precise, uh, fire safety engineering is the application of engineering principles having a base understanding, scientific understanding of fire. And then you also need to understand the consequences of fire and how people behave uh, uh, in, in case of fire. Therefore, understanding the interaction between the people, the fire and the building itself becomes vital in making decisions for fire protection. This can be summarized in the primary goals of uh, fire safety, which is to safeguard lives and to, to protect our properties. Um, this brings us to, to ask who can claim being a fire safety engineer. Um, I would say uh, from my own point of view that a fire safety engineer, someone who really applies the engineering principles when solving a fire related issues. And um, the, the primary goal that a fire safety engineer should be expected to be able to perform is to develop from the first principles during the design process, the specifications of fire safety strategy that here balances the requirements of all the stakeholders involved in the building whilst ensuring adequate performance of the building in case of fire. Then after setting uh, the fire safety objectives, uh, the fire safety engineer is expected to, to work with the other professionals involved in the building, such as the, the architect or, or the structural engineer or the mechanical engineer, to review all the building designs. And the goal to, of this review is to identify uh, potential fire safety hazards and thus uh, providing solutions. Well, it depends on the complexity of the design. The solution can then be evaluated using uh, CFD calculations or hand calculations, depending which one is available to the, to the engineer. Um, fire safety engineering competency um, entails having a mix of backgrounds in engineering. And also you have the skills, the experience and other possible attributes. Uh, these backgrounds uh, include, amongst others, having deep knowledge of uh, heat and mass transfer, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, human behavior, um, acquiring knowledge of building design or architectural design is also a plus. Um, possessing professional ethics, uh, fire safety culture is also a very important attribute to being a, a competent uh, fire safety engineer. Um, just three years ago in 2020, the Modern Building Alliance conducted uh, with the help of an external contractor an architect survey on fire safety competency. And uh, the outcome showed that in, in building construction, sustainability experts are more involved in building construction than the fire safety engineer. Um, the, the survey also showed that uh, fire safety engineers are mainly involved when there is fuel that the design is complex or when the law requires it. And this is different from one country to the, to the other. So we therefore need to start to make more awareness. I think we've done a lot today on the importance of involving fire safety engineers, especially at the design stage, even when the law does not require it. And how then can you become a fire safety engineer? Um, to, to become a fire safety engineer, there are several acad academic uh, programs around the EU. Uh, one of the best example is uh, the International Master in fire safety engineering, the IMFSE. Um, so uh, this is um, a two-year master program co-financed by the EU 
via the Erasmus program. Um, it's commonly organized by eight different universities in and out of the EU. Uh, the students in this program have the opportunity to do each semester in a different location. So sometimes so one is in Ghent, you can go to the UK and uh, other partner universities. And you can also earn a full or part scholarship to, to do this uh, master. So if you are interested, you know what to do. Um, a similar program also is organized uh, by the Ghent University here in Belgium. Uh, this program, uh, you have to do all the four semesters in Ghent, so it's different from the IMF. More or less, this is uh, the difference between the IMFSE and, and, and uh, this program. Uh, and this is actually the, the program which I graduated from. Um, additionally, there is also a postgraduate program for people who are already working and you don't have any time to go uh, bring out two years to make a study, but this one allows you to study part time for two years and you can even spread it as much as you as you want. Um, on the prospects, uh, the other people already said a lot of things here, but I just want to re-emphasize that there's a lot of things you can do being a graduate of fire safety engineering. Um, currently in the EU, there is a, a shortage of fire safety engineers. So there is a huge market. As a fire safety engineer, you can work in engineering company or fire service, uh, health organization for the government in research, um, even the universities. The, I will say the opportunities are limitless. So uh, please go for it. Um, uh, the fire safety engineer can also specialize in one of the seven layers of uh, fire safety in buildings. Um, you can specialize in prevention or detection or suppression or structural fire safety. The list is not limited to this, but just to give you an overview of um, where uh, you can specialize. Most fire safety engineers I know do a mix of, uh, of, of them. Um, so in, in our assessment, we believe that uh, fire safety engineering is really an interesting career choice. Uh, we need to make the fire safety education more attractive to young people, which the other speakers have uh, already said a lot about it. Uh, more interactions between experts in building and construction should be encouraged by improving communication and collaboration, even through research. And this brings me to the conclusion. I hope I'm on time. Um, I cannot <laughs> overemphasize the importance of fire safety engineering to finding innovative solutions to our current fire safety challenges. Um, fire safety engineers are key role players in this. and They should be responsible for fire safety in buildings or they should be handed over this duty. Um, the Modern Building Alliance has uh, some recommendations uh, which will further improve the use of fire safety engineering in the EU. First is to start and support the education and training of fire safety engineers. Um, also good to um, make people uh, involve a dedicated fire safety engineer from the design stage. So when you start thinking about building, you should already have a fire safety engineer uh, at the back of your mind. Um, it is time that uh, we recognize fire safety engineering as a, an independent profession to make it more attractive. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, there is urgent need to harmonize this practice so that uh, a fire safety engineer in Belgium can freely uh, work in Spain and Italy without any limitations and vice versa. So um, thank you once again uh, for having me and I will um, invite you to visit our website to get more uh, information about this uh, report and also other documents we have on our website. 
and I will put the link to this um, document so you can download it. It's a three pager or four pager. You can at your own time, please uh, have a look and read and I hope I can get feedback from you. Thank you very much and take care, Lisa. Thank you very much, Franklin, for, first of all, for giving us a preview of the study that the Modern Binet Alliance has done on fire safety engineering competency and uh, for sharing it with us. We will make sure that we will put it also, the link to your report in the uh, European Fire Safety Week uh, landing page so that everybody that wants to download it um, will do so via yeah. the Modern Binet Alliance page. Um, may I ask you a question? Uh, because you yes. have also been very much on time. There's uh, a couple of questions that maybe are in the in the chat for you, but uh, I will let you a little bit more time for those. But uh, I want to, to know what is your take, because I think the International Master of Science for Fire Safety Engineering is being quite mm -hmm. successful. So it's been yeah. running in Europe for a few years, but I see that the number of universities is not very big yet. So uh, in our attempt to support that more universities will join the program, what do you think that we will need for those universities to to really enjoy the uh, or join, sorry, the the initiative? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I would say uh, the IMFSC itself has a procedure which they accept uh, universities into their consortium. Uh, first of all, at least you will have something to offer. Either you have maybe existing program in one of the layers of fire safety, maybe people who already focus in prevention or, or you are uh, you have a focus in structural fire safety, then you can go to the IMFSE and then they see if it will be um, good to have the collaboration. So I will say first, to, it will be best that uh, interested universities to make a contact with the IMFSE administration and they can uh, look this out. Um, another suggestion would be that um, people who don't have the capacity can already train future lecturers or trainers in the existing programs. And in four, five years, 10 years, they are now capable to host these programs in their various universities. That, that way we can have more fire safety engineers being graduated and being uh, getting into the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have a couple more questions that we will do afterwards in the in the panel, in the joint panel at the end. Uh, just to advance you that one of them is about recognition of titles. So somebody is asking whether a fire safety engineer can work in Europe with a technical diploma, which the answer is not that easy as a yes or a no. Yeah, uh, and, and there's also another question about uh, whether there's a difference in Europe between fire protection engineers and fire safety engineers. But I let you think about those while I introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, because as uh, so, it's not only about engineering and studies, uh, formal education at universities. Some European countries are also implementing best practices for the qualification of fire safety specialists to secure also the higher the higher standards or the highest standards of these professionals. And to share with us the experience of Italy in this field, we have this afternoon. Giuseppe Giuffrida from CENITAL, the Italian Association of Natural Lighting and Ventilation Systems, as well as Smoke and Heat Control Systems. Giuseppe graduated from mechanical engineering from uh, some years ago and has been manager of CENITAL since 92. He is a qualified engineer, registered in the Ministry of the Interior in Italy, and he's going to explain us what that is. Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon to all. I hope you hear me well. Now I will. Uh, I heard from uh, <clears throat> training for fire safety engineer, but the problem now is uh, for for Italy is also to go through a new way to design fire safety through a performance-based design 
but we look also to all the safety, fire safety installation existing to be well maintained, to be sure that when there is a fire, this installation work well. Especially in the workplaces, we have a, a regulation for safety in general and also for fire prevention. Since uh, 1998, we have a decree to be able to have a good design of the fire safety, to have a good management of the fire safety and fire emergency, but also we know how to make control and maintenance of fire fighting system and equipment. This decree, old because it's before it's in the last uh, century, we have the obligation to make a good control and maintenance through surveillance, routine inspection and maintenance. We have to reduce all the operation made for this maintenance. And also the decree ask to have qualified people and competent people to do this work. But in this old decree, it was only a qualitative definition of the competence and the qualification. So we have no compulsory rules to be qualified. And it was a, a big problem because the users, the owners, had to make a personal evaluation of the competence of the people. In the last years, this degree was cancelled and replaced by three new decrees, one only for the control and the maintenance of fire fighting system and equipment, a degree to say how to manage and the fire safety and the fire emergency, and the last degree, how to design fire safety. Also in Italy, we are going to new rules to make a performance-based design of the fire safety. But in parallel now, we are also working to have very competent people to make the maintenance of the installation. In this new decree concerning the control and the maintenance, we have the same obligation to make control maintenance through surveillance, routine inspection and maintenance to reduce every activities. But now we have the way to qualify the people. So activities shall be carried out by qualified maintenance technicians. How to qualify the technicians? It's written in the decree. It's a way very important to get this qualification. In the decree, we give also tasks and activities of these technicians. They are to be able to, to, be able to check the documentation, to check also if the documentation of all the equipment are really complete and good. They have to be able to check all the components and the systems to make a test on the systems using always the standards existing concerning the design of the installation and the maintenance of the installation the rule of the art. 
And uh, through this, all these activities, we have uh, the insurance that the installation will remain every time in a good state and ready to work when there is the fire. There is a training made by a lot of training centers. This qualification is, can be get through an examin examination by a fire officer's commission. The regulators gives the possibility to training body, organization and association having the know-how of all the firefighting system to organize training centers and examination locations. For example, Zenital, who is expert of smoke management, can be a training body and they can give the authorization to the training center able to make the training of the technician. This training is, is a theoretical but also practical training. During this course, the training center have, shall be a, with an equipment able to make simulation of the way of aging of the installation. This, uh, all this information are inside the decree. We have minimum training programs regarding contents and duration. We have a minimum training equipment necessary for the training, but also for the examination to get the cert final certification. Now, we have about 15 firefighting system and equipment certification forecasted. For example, I put on this table the time required for the theoretical and practical training for the three smoke management systems present in, the, in this degree, natural smoke and heat ventilation systems, power smoke and heat ventilation system, and also pressure differential systems. I add also the time forecast for the training for automatic sprinkler systems. You can look at the time, it's not a short time. It's about 24 hours. So it means three days of training. And in these three days, we have only one day to make all the practical training on the installation, to know every component and the way of activation of all this system. Now, the decree is, was, was published and in 2021. The decree is in force, but the obligation of certification is not still in force. The certification requirement will come into force on 25 of September 2024, because during this time, we worked a lot in collaboration with the five brigade who created an observatory to get to reach to the application of the certification procedure, because we we uh, wrote all the details of all the course, practical and theoretical. We 
wrote also all the question to put during the examination. The fire brigade call all the experts of the main fire safety association and organization. And we think that this uh, training of the technician for the maintenance will be also useful not only to have a good maintenance of the installation, but to re to elevate the culture of the fire safety on the market. In parallel with all the work made for the uh, training of the fire safety engineering in all the market. Thank you, Giuseppe, for this introduction to the to the Italian to the new Italian system that is going to enter into force. Uh, at least the certifications are going to be compulsory as of September 2024. Yes, Still sir. some months to go. Um, I understand that the the trainings are already ongoing. May I ask you when are the FACS exams for for the new people to get qualified? And uh, we are. I think that the um, the work is very very long. The fire brigade uh, make also some training for their officers. So training was made by the specialists, by the associations and organizations. And I think now the that the fire brigade will be ready before the, the end of this year to begin to make the, the first exam for the okay. certification. It's a that very big work and there are very many, many people to qualify. Yeah. We are speaking about thousands of people. Yes. Uh, that's why I was asking, I was wondering whether the first exams are going to be soon. I'm happy to hear that that's the case. Uh, so I guess uh, that you will have a lot of work to do on qualification of uh, professionals in Italy in the first semester of 2023. Uh, we are very well on time. Let me ask, let me come back to a question, Franklin. Uh, there was a question in the, well, there were a couple of questions on fire safety engineering. Let me pick up one, which is mm. the one on, on, can you be a fire safety engineer with a technical diploma in Europe? Uh, that would be a very difficult question to answer um, <laughs> because, because uh, right now uh, I will say uh, for a diploma or masters to be recognized or that, that should be a professional authority who says you can do this with that, you can do that with that. That does not exist now in Europe, and that is why we have we are calling for recognition, professional recognition of fire safety engineering. So, when we recognize fire safety engineering, there will be a professional body, and then there will be binding code and ethics, and then this professional body will say, okay, you have this training you need to do this and this to be a fire safety engineer, or you've been um, through the master's program, you don't need any other thing, or you need five years experience. So it's left for the professional bodies to say, this is what you need to do. And that we don't have now. So we need to do it urgently so that we can harmonize every other thing. Similar to the question the other person asked, if a uh, fire protection engineer is uh, referred that so this is different between terminologies. Fire protection engineers are mainly is the term used in America, and fire safety engineers is what is normally used in Europe. And if we have a professional body, and they can say to be this, you see that this is the title fire safety engineer or fire protection engineer. Or so, yeah, I cannot really give a direct answer until we have a professional body who can say, let's do this. Yeah, but I, I think that's exactly the answer that the person or the people were looking for. No, we don't have a professional body in Europe at this moment uh, to harmonize and recognize the different titles in the different countries. That might come, and that's a little bit what uh, Franklin and, and the team are working on. 
trying to to make that uh, uh, become a reality. Um, uh, Giuseppe, um, just a, a short question um, because it's not in the it's not in the chat, but uh, I think it's also fair to say that as of September 2024, people doing maintenance in Italy have to be qualified and has to have a certificate to do so, right? I people should have this certification. <laughs> <laughs> before yes. before this date, uh, all people who need certification will have uh, presented a, a request for the exam. But I don't think that uh, before 24, 2024, uh, Fire will be able to make all the exam. We have no time enough. <laughs> We will see. We will see what happens in the first semester. Uh, in any case, it was interesting for but, us, I think, to learn that the work is on progress and that the first uh, professionals yes. will be qualified soon. But we are optimistic. It's a, it's a, it's a new uh, for the fire brigade. I think also it's a new way of working because they work together with the stakeholders. They don't write the regulation by themselves. There is a, a very good collaboration to get yeah. the right solution. And, and that would be, I'm sure, the, the recipe for success, both for professional qualification and for fire safety engineering, a good collaboration among the institutions. Now, we have also in Italy uh, 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 an example for fire safety engineer the last year begin a new master in the Bo University of Bolsa Bolson, Bolzano. And uh, we are going on for the next year for the, the new uh, new version of the master. And uh, this master is uh, organized in collaboration with the five big brigade. We have experts as teacher but we have also five officers as a student. It seems uh, it's a good way of uh, to make a training for a good fire uh, safety engineer. We have the experience of the theoretical people engineer, but we have also experience of people who have to, to extinguish the fire. Which shows that in our sector, uh, it's also important to have the practical experience and uh, not only the theoretical one. Thank you very much, guys, for sharing with us this afternoon your experience and your insights on the professional education and professional qualification. Um, so the industry is working hard, as you can see, to both find and attract talent, but also to promote and support the highest standards of education and qualification. And in our event today, uh, we'll not be complete without having a perspective, a policy perspective from the European Commission. And to do that, I have the pleasure to have with us or to, to uh, present you our next speaker, who is uh, the, a colleague from the DG Grow. Uh, for those of you not being in Europe, uh, DG Grow is responsible for most things in the industry. Roman Hogwarts. Thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon and for sharing also with us your perspective on how to improve the human capital basis in Europe. Floor is yours, Roman. Dear Elisa, thank you very much for inviting me today and letting me to be part of fire safety community. Uh, my presentation is a bit broader because let's say I will focus on uh, uh, construction industry or construction ecosystem, I'll explain later, but this uh, ecosystem is very important for fire safety because those uh, are, let's say, architects and construction engineers who are designing buildings and infrastructure and there are crafts who are implementing, let's say, those, those design, so putting in practice a fire safety for all habitants, so all citizens, to make our built environment safe. 
I will speak about human capital, so among people, so how, how to get people, how to train them, uh, what are possible means, what are policies, uh, so to provide you with, with some details. Of course, I cannot uh, uh, provide details about everything. You will find in my slides some links when you, where you will find more information or more details. Of course, you can contact me afterwards and I would be happy to discuss with you or provide you additional information. Firstly, I need to say that uh, regarding training, education, uh, it's, uh, those powers are at member states level. So the Commission has a really limited possibilities to influence it, but the Commission is very strong in creation of partnerships. So trying, let's say, to group people, to group stakeholders, to group member states, and with common effort to achieve some progress and, let's say, targets and to overcome challenges. Uh, regarding this one, uh, Commission is very vocal about skills. Uh, of, uh, I don't know whether I see my presentation in bad manner, but usually I don't see the top link. Okay. I don't know whether you see it, but I don't usually see first link of titles. I already saw it on the first slide, also on the, sec the second slide, I don't see first link of my presentation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, the, the problem might be on my side. Okay, so let's say usually I will mention it. What is the top mm -hmm. link? Uh, first link, which is not mentioned, you see the, here mentioned the European Vocational Skills Week and European Gender Equality Week, which uh, ran last week of October. So usually we try to raise some awareness, uh, uh, encourage, encourage debate, generate momentum and inspire future initiatives. Uh, the top link, which is not seen, is the European Year of Skills which is running as of 9 May this year and will run till May next year. So the whole year usually is devoted to some kind of policy or activity in the Commission and the Union. And this year it is year of skills. So this definitely show how important skills are for the Commission, for the Union. So they are at the heart of EU policies. Next slide, please. The construction ecosystem. Now I see the title, so it's perfect. Uh, it's very important Green Deal enable, and Green Deal means that uh, it's connected with carbon neutrality, so consumption and energy. In this case of construction and buildings, energy efficiency and the renovation of buildings. So renovation of buildings is also option for all buildings to get more fire safe. So this is the opportunity which is being encouraged by the Commission and it's also stated in European Performance of Buildings Directive that renovation of building should be used for improving of fire safety of old buildings. When we are speaking about construction ecosystem, construction ecosystem is something like value chain. So let's say various areas of construction which are collaborating the, together and in this respect it means activities, works, services, not really production of construction products. It's a different area. So I will speak about provision of services, so provision of construction works. In this area, we are speaking about 25 million of workers, so people involved in the ecosystem, of which is principal part is active in construction, 30 million, and in architectural engineering services is 3 million. As it was said, yeah, let's say not just fire, uh, fire, let's say engineers and uh, let's say fire safety, active personnel, uh, there is a lack of people and skills. It's also true for the whole construction ecosystem. And uh, there is also lack of, of females, that females, op there's opportunity of female to be part of the ecosystem and to fill the gaps because Often uh, it provides unique opportunity for, for uh, let's say, a professional life of females. Those various professions in construction are unique and it's not possible to see them anywhere else. So it might be, let's say, interesting for them. 
of course, uh, the construction has a bit bad connotation that of, because of physical aspect of the work being heavy, taking place outside. But uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, balance getting that there are new materials, new innovative te technologies. We have heard today about digitalization. So it's possible to say that from here to there, we have some sexy toys to attract some new entrants, new talent females as well. Next slide, please. OK. Uh, here we don't see only date, which is stating 15 of March 23, and this is the day when this transition pathway for construction was published. It is a document which is summarizing what's going on in construction in the union and what are challenges and also opportunities for coming years. This document is some kind of new Bible for us. And it was co-created with our stakeholders. We are running a platform which is called High Level Construction Forum. And this platform serves us as a possibility to consult our stakeholders, to organize a workshop for them, let's say to present our ideas, to get their feedback also via various survey. And based on our collaboration, we produce this document. There is a link and uh, to the document and also to the website where you will find uh, more information if you would like to go deeper, let's say, in this area. And if you would like to be part of our construction forum, there's a link in which you can register. Usually we are sending a newsletter about our events. So once per year we have a let's say a global forum meeting all possible interested stakeholders and several times per year we are having workshops or webinars or various topics of general interest of our stakeholders also trying to get the feedback and let's say to help us to shape our policies in the future. Next slide please. Uh, just briefly, the transition pathway document uh, is based on six building blocks. Uh, I would, uh, let's say, draw your attention on second building block, which is about skills and talent. So those is tackling with current challenges, but also opportunities for future regarding skills and talents. And the last building block is a safe and fair built environment. And this is the building block in which also fire safety of buildings and environment is being tackled. Next slide, please. As I said, uh, the document was co-created with our stakeholders, with the, the industry itself. So it presents the current activities, but also some some desired activities for the future to achieve certain targets, like uh, to have the whole ecosystem more green, to fulfill, let's say, climate targets of the union, but also more digital, let's say, to be able to provide, to, let's say, as we have heard that uh, there is a, let's say, demographic, demographic problem, let's say, to, so to provide more work with less people, and also to be resilient, not so far away, we had the COVID crisis, so we need to build resilience of the industry, which should be coped with such a disasters as we have had here uh, some time ago. And for that, we also inviting our stakeholders to present their activities in the spirit of those action actions proposed in the document because you as our stakeholders are doing wonderful things but we often we don't know about them so we would like to invite you to be vocal about your activities and to present them so we are collecting some kind of commitments or pledges so activities which our stakeholders are doing already in the document trans of transition pathway there's mention about 40 of such a commitments or activities of our stakeholders and we are the, there is a link in which we'll publish additional commitments which are receiving let's say on almost daily basis from our stakeholders so please i would like to invite you to have a look 
at our document of constitutional pathway, look at the chapter two, which focus on skills, or six, which focus on fire safety, and perhaps you might find some activities to which your daily activities would fit and just report about them. We don't know, let's say, really are not inviting you to develop something, something very sophisticated. Sometimes it's or frequently is enough when you are reporting your daily activities and plans because they might be very valuable and also might serve as an inspiration for others. I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation partnerships. So we just try to build a partnership about this transition pathway, collecting activities of our stakeholders for inspiration, but also for common effort to achieve targets which we were set up in the transition pathway document. Next slide, please. Here I would like to, uh, to mention something about the funding because it's frequently needed that uh, the skills development is being supported. Uh, the construction very much is fragmented. There is a lot of micro companies and sometimes they don't have a means to really develop skills of their employees. Of course, when uh, the employees are, let's say, well trained, their productivity is increasing and also their happiness at the work. So they are staying and let's say producing more. Uh, in this regard, we have like two uh, sourcing uh, instruments. One are, let's say, for member states, which for national projects, which is cohesion policy and national recovery and resilience plans. Those uh, funding instruments are for member states. Usually they are at the position to decide what kind of activities they would like to fund. Uh, and this is the point that usually when they are preparing some kind of programming documents, uh, those documents are a bit general. It's understandable because uh, those documents are being prepared for seven years and for seven years is sometimes difficult to, to expect or to present really what would be challenges for next seven years regarding the whole national economy. Therefore, if our stakeholders would like to get some fair share of those budget and let's say to be attributed to skills development in construction sector or in fire safety area, they need to be vocal. They need to be vocal and they need to press to national governments and ask for a fair share of those means being provided via these huge programs. Uh, in both those policy instruments, cohesion policy and national recovery and resilience plans, a big part is devoting to energy efficiency. And it's mentioned that the appropriate skills should be developed. And energy efficiency, I said, means that uh, uh, it's connected with renovation of buildings and possibility to address fire safety of all the buildings. Therefore, this is a big opportunity, let's say, to get your workforce upskilled and more performing regarding their work. Of course, there is a lot of other activities in those funding instruments which are focusing on building of physical assets. So when somebody speaking like about judicial reform, sometimes it might be connected with building of new buildings for courts or renovation of existing building. It's not directly renovated, uh, regard, uh, related to the construction, but indirectly it is because those activities are bringing work for construction companies and increasing their cash flow. And then it's possible to use part of such a increased cash flow also for upskilling activities. The European Commission is also providing means for transnational EU-wide projects. So projects for which partners are from several member states, so not just one. Usually those are various construction related stakeholders, providers of training or universities. 
and principally such uh, projects are focusing either on energy efficiency, digitalization or sustainability. Two principal financial means for funding are Erasmus Plus and LIFE. For LIFE, I provided link to Build Up Skills Initiative, which uh, already funded almost 100 projects so far. And Erasmus Plus, a link you will find on our website, which I mentioned earlier when I spoke about transition pathway. Next slide, please. Attracting talent. Yeah, this is the the, the initiative which was mentioned by Elisa previously from the Bowen, so women can build. But I will start in general attracting talent, uh, young talent or women. It's not really the role of the Commission. It's usually national role, regional role, even local role, either national administration or administration at appropriate level or of our stakeholders because there are frequently being various, uh, uh, let's say, uh, conditions which are relevant either at national or local level, and it's rather difficult to build some campaigns at European level. So the, it's, those campaigns should really reflect national local conditions. Fre uh, we run a big project which was called Construction Blueprint. Uh, you can find it partially on others construction blueprint EU. And this project focus in 12 member states in deep about challenges and opportunities regarding skills development in energy efficiency, digitalization and sustainability. And among others, it collected some kind of best practice how various stakeholders in those 12 member states are trying to attract talents or let's say females or youngsters. So how they are trying to get them to the construction industry to get fair share of young talent and women to the industry. Uh, there are various examples and one of example which is rather fresh being created last year is a, is a ser Dutch series which was already presented twice uh, in Dutch TV, which is Frauen de Bauen. It was six pieces series about 16 women active in construction. They are not really firewomen, but they are ladies operating heavy machinery or putting plaster walls, putting installations, putting photovoltaic panels, or being in management of some construction uh, activities. Uh, there is a link in which are all six pieces of this series, and there is a, a very nice trailer. It takes just one minute, so if nothing else, just look at trailer. It's very interesting. Uh, principally, all activities uh, which are being run by national stakeholders focus in general a lot of about opportunities for women and young talents and role models. So they are providing some, some examples how those in the sector, let's say, are behaving, what are the, let's say, their daily business and what are, let's say, really best opportunities how to, how to further develop their working life. Uh, in this regard, the Commission ran an initiative which is called Pact for Skills, and it's really some kind of partnership creation between all construction stakeholders. And its aim is to share expertise and pool resources. It's rather similar what I spoke about the transition pathway and its commitments, but in this regard, it focuses just on skills. So the stakeholders are presenting some somehow some kind of commitments focusing on skills development. The initiative is run in the construction sector by three organizations which is FIEC, European Construction Industry Federation, European Federation of Build, uh, Building and Woodworkers, and uh, European uh, Building Confeder uh, Builders Confederation. So those three sectoral organizations are at the lead of the Pact for Skills. There is a link at the top 
which provides more information about the whole pack for skills in the construction. At the bottom, there is some kind of manifesto of those three organization, which uh, in which they are, let's say, stating their aims and uh, targets for the for this initiative, which is planning to last five years for the moment. Uh, you, you can also consult their website of those three organizations where you will find further details how to join the pact. And let's say you can, let's say, see some other organization who already, or let's say, us, or companies or even individuals who already joined the pact presenting their activities. As I said, it's for us, it's very important that our stakeholders are vocal. They are doing magnificent, magnificent things. And it's very nice to present those things and to serve as a inspiration for others, but also, also to show politicians that the construction is active and perhaps it really deserves fair share of attention either regarding means or some, some policy effort. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, we already have heard uh, about some possibilities when I'm, I'm whether when I have some kind of technical background, whether I could be fire safety engineer in any European country. This is a bit still issue because as I said, training, skills, education are almost fully in the hands of member states. So they are, let's say, setting some conditions for entering national labor markets. And as we have single market for 30 years already this year, in March, Commission published several communications about the current status quo and also about future challenges and opportunities. And one of the challenges was that uh, there, there are still some barriers for cross-border provision of services and uh, recognition of qualification among states. And this should be further addressed. Of course, it's impossible for Commission to address it alone. It needs to cooperate with member states and trying to let's say, facilitate those either provision of services or recognition of qualification. At the link, you will find more documents about this effort. I just here would like to mention the European Professional Card uh, developed some years ago, and it's an electronic procedure to facilitate the recognition of a regulated profession in another EU country. At the link, you will see there is already several areas for which the European Professional Card is active. One of the uh, areas which was considered was also some kind of card for engineers, not just fire safety engineers, but engineers in general. So far, it hasn't been materialized because uh, our colleagues found that there is too many various engineering studying programs and it's rather difficult to, to uh, let's say somehow to sum them up for a card. Therefore, some other approach will need to be, let's say, selected in the future how to address this issue or challenge. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, information, uh, a bit of top is missing, but uh, we are, are running European Construction Sector Observatory, which was launched in 2015. There is a link of observatory, and it provides some kind of country fact sheets, policy fact sheets, and analytical and trend reports. So it inf provides information a bit about every member state in the Union regarding uh, its construction sector in a global position of national economy. So there are also some demographic data, economic data, also various other information, which uh, somehow summarize globally what are the challenges in particular member states, what are strong points, weak points, what are outlooks for the coming years. And this we are trying to update annually those country fact sheets. Uh, policy fact sheets are focusing on various interesting 
policy measures or funding measures, which might serve as a example of good practice for others. And analytical and trend reports are focusing on some broader cross EU issues. Well, as an example, there is a first page of the analytical report on human capital basis on skills on people. There's already, uh, let's say, link to observatory and you can consult the report there. At the moment, we are at the process of uh, acquiring a new um, a new contractor to run the observatory further in the coming years. But it's a very good source of information, a really detailed one based on big collection of data. So definitely I would like to invite you to consult it. And the last slide, please. The Commission is running Fire Information Exchange platform, as you might know, and I would like to invite you all to a webinar on Thursday, which will be on fire safety in the growing vulnerable communities in the Union, also including presentation a year of uh, fire, uh, information exchange platform seminars. So the it's on Thursday in the afternoon, and I would be very happy when you will attend the, the webinar and let's say, see what kind of activities Commission is doing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Roman, for being with us this afternoon um, and for sharing with us all the activities that the Commission is doing not specifically necessarily in the field of fire safety, but in overall in the field of construction. I think that's very useful for all of us. Uh, for the colleagues that are outside of Europe, from outside of Europe, uh, I think it's also important to understand that we uh, have different member states and in questions related to buildings and to fire safety in particular, um, there's still some harmonization to be undertaken in, in, the, in Europe but that the Commission is, is working on it and that there's a progress uh, of the discussions between the Commission and the Member States to make this a reality. Thank you very much for, for sharing this with us this afternoon. So um, I it's my, my role now just to close the meeting, as you have uh, and well understood, fire safety is not only at the heart of our operations, but it, we also believe it's paramount to integrate fire safety measures in building construction and renovation to better protect the European citizens in case of fire. We are well aware that these demands uh, require some additional skills. And now that more than ever, the fire sector needs to attract talent in order to thrive. And this afternoon, thanks to Andrew, George and Miguel, we have got inspired on the what is the why that the people is looking for and how to maybe recruit and keep them working with us. And uh, we also have to work to increase the competency of our professionals working in the field. And both Franklin and Giuseppe showed us best practices going forward that we would be, uh, that we could use. We hope that you have enjoyed this seminar. I invite you to check the Euralarm uh, false false alarms uh, study, an event they are organizing in December on digitalization, and not to miss the opportunity to check and download the publication of the Modern Building Alliance study on fire safe competency. Thank you very much to all the participants that have joined us this afternoon from different parts of the world. Thank you very much to all the speakers that have shared with us their, their knowledge. I wish you all a uh, happy and nice European Fire Safety Week 2023. From our side, bye from now. <laughs>